So, this is the Hobbit. I cannot guarantee his safety. Understood. You will see more of Middle-earth than you've ever seen before. To actually go back inside Middle-earth, it will be a real event movie. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Mr. Richard Armitage. <laughs> All right, now Richard, you brought yourself to Thorin Oakenshield, and we did have a fan question that asked, what in fact does playing Thorin Oakenshield leave with you as a person and an actor? Uh, I think it's kind of an interesting question because um, I haven't left Thorin Oakenshield yet. So he's kind of, all of him is still with me. But I think the one thing that I discovered um, about myself uh, whilst creating the role was the realization about leadership by example. So, um, because I'm not really a, a, a bold leader as a person, and I, I found in him a nobility which is about leading by example, not necessarily by dictation. So, really, that's the biggest thing that I, that I learned for myself. All right, so if you're in trouble, pick up a piece of wood and kill somebody. Yeah. <laughs> now, one of the most interesting things about this particular character is the heavy makeup that you work with. Were you surprised and shocked by how different you look on screen? And was the acting process similar to, say, mask work um, when you're trying to convey emotion through that makeup and the giant beards? Um, yeah, I mean, when I, when I met Peter, um, actually before meeting Peter, there was, there's, you get a character breakdown and it, it does say, we'll be required to wear some prosthetics. Um, <laughs> So I knew there would be something, whether it was, a, I don't know, some ears or something, I thought, maybe. But, but um, it was extensive, and the initial manifestation of Thorin was much greater than what you see there. They worked with my, my own face to try and make it look like it wasn't uh, too dramatic, which was a slow process, and it, it changed throughout the course of filming. I did do mask work at drama school, so it was useful to, to see my face and try and make it move in the mirror, um, and I spent a lot of time doing that. I also worked with Tammy Lane, who was my prosthetics artist, to try and make sure that the flashing on the eyes wasn't too heavy so that I could move my eyebrows. Um, you know, the eyes move in such a, uh, a, a sensitive way. I didn't want that to be inhibited in any way because I felt that the key to seeing into Thorin's heart was through his eyes. Um, and I was nervous about having all of that on my face. But I think it worked out okay. And I, you know, I... When I took the prosthetic off, my face was much more animated than, than I normally am as a person, but that was just because of the muscles being exercised a little bit more. Now, what is it that you think is left behind for audiences today, as opposed to, say, the audiences of Tolkien's time who would have seen it as a direct metaphor for World War I? Yeah, I mean, it was something I discovered as I was researching uh, The Hobbit, because um, I read Tolkien's biography and I think he talks a lot about his experiences in World War I. The loss of his fellowship, I think, really informed what he was writing about. And the rise of evil, you know, in uh, Europe was something very much in his head when he wrote the book. Um, I think audiences of the time would have understood that more closely. But at the same time, we, you know, we're living in a, a time where, you know, our children, our friends are going to other parts of the world to fight, fight battles. And um, particularly with the dwarves, the idea of an exiled people returning home, trying to find their homeland was, I mean, that's a story which pervade, you know, across time. So all of these things resonate for you. Um, they give you ideas, but at the same time, we're making a fantasy movie, you know, essentially aimed at young adults. So we, you know, you just bear it in mind and try not to get too heavy and political about it. Well, I think that's the most interesting thing, is ultimately these films are entertainment. It's fun. And I want to ask you about the fun of it, because obviously 266 days of hard work, of emoting under heavy makeup, heavy battle gear, and of course, throwing Orchrist around. I mean, how heavy is Orchrist to wave above your head? Is it just a piece of balsa wood, or is it a lovely, wetter work? Um, I've got to say, most of the fun was had offset. <laughs> Um, no, I, uh, the first day I had all the costume on and all the makeup, and, and um, it, was, it was so hot and heavy, um, as you've probably heard from many of the other whinging actors on this movie. Um, 
but I made a conscious decision that I didn't want it to inhibit what I was doing. And I knew that if I, if I really concentrated on the character that I could, you know, try and have some fun with Thorin. He's not a big bag of laughs, I've got to be honest. <laughs> it was a challenge looking for a single moment to make him smile. For me, I have fun when I'm being tested and when I'm being pushed. And, you know, this was an endurance test from beginning to end. And if it hadn't been for my fellow dwarves, British, Kiwi, um, and that, that coming together of two cultures, uh, I really would have had a lot less fun. But um, we had such a great cast, and I can't wait to see them again. Um, I started training again at the end of January so that I could swing that heavy sword around that you're talking about. But I was gifted a replica of the sword so I've had practice. I, I was very close to taking it to the gym with me and swing it around. Yeah. Um, now, you talk about having fun on set. Um, and I want to perhaps delve into some of the stories that you may not have regurgitated previously. Um, perhaps ones where the director may have been put in a very embarrassing situation. Um, our director put himself in a very embarrassing situation. <laughs> You might want to not film this because I'll get into trouble. Okay, so you know at the end of the first film when you see Thorin on the tree and he's about to attack Azog? I didn't really know what, what Pete was shooting there. Um, and we would, I was trying to run down the tree trunk wearing these massive dwarf boots. Um, and I obviously wasn't coming down quick enough. So Pete got up on the tree and said, no, no, this is how you do it. Um, he came running down so fast. By the time he got to the bottom, his pants had fallen down. <laughs> around his ankles in front of the entire crew and they had been filming it. Um, so somewhere there's a video of, of Pete with his pants around his ankles. Sir Peter Jackson, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Um, although he's not the first person to lose their trousers on the set of The Hobbit, I want to take you to a fan question about Dwarfs Illustrated 2012. <laughs> Um, this was actually my idea. Don't let Graham McTavish tell you anything different. This was my idea. Um, it, was, it was Pete's 50th birthday, and we decided that we would create a naked dwarf calendar. <laughs> but of course, you know what a naked dwarf looks like. Um, we're loaded with padding. So that was the joke. And uh, basically, every dwarf was a different month in various compromising positions. <laughs> but there is only one copy which Peter owns, and Graham wanted to make more, and I said, absolutely not, there is only one copy, and there only ever will be. Obviously, Thorin Oak and Shield. Are you, have a strategically placed piece of oak, or? <laughs> What happened in the calendar stays in the calendar. Well, that's all we have time for, for Mr. December. I'm going to ask one more question, then I'll throw it open to the floor. I think we need to talk about the singing, um, because the first thing that snapped this film away from the normal zeitgeist of action hero movies was the first trailer, which had men, dwarves, singing. From your perspective, as a you were a song and dance man before you went into the more serious side of drama, and what it was like to actually sing in camera, so to speak, with the other dwarves. Um, I did a production of the, the Hobbit when I was 13, which was a musical, really. Um, so I knew that Tolkien had written loads of songs uh, through the literature, so I was really excited that they were gonna put this song in. Um, Fran Walsh wrote the theme um, that Fran is, is Peter's partner and writing partner and she wrote the, the tune um, so I was really honoured to have been asked to take the first line of that song um, I didn't want him to sound like a singer uh, so I listened to a lot of Russian uh, church music I listened to, a, to um, a male voice choir Welsh male vo voice choir and we, I worked with a pianist and we slowly took the pitch down and down until I, we got to a point that it sounded as Tolkien was describing it which was the deep throated singing of the dwarves um, and then it, um, we went into a studio, we recorded it a number of times. I wanted to keep recording it until the end of time because I was not ever happy with it. Um, but yeah, I think it, was, I think it was one of those moments that they didn't know what that song was going to sound like. Um, and when 
you know, obviously all of the, the men and the boys, the, the other dwarves, that blend of sound was so beautiful that they just decided to use it as the trailer. Far over the misty mountains cold To dungeons deep and caverns Did you ever record the full version of that song? I know Neil Finn did it, but it's not as good. Um, <laughs> Um, you're about to see the film, and it, it is quite long. <laughs> so, if that song had been any longer, I think um, I think it would people would have got a bit impatient. Um, but there was a moment where um, I nearly got to sing the song at the end, nearly. Um, but I, I just think I just thought it was maybe not appropriate that one of the characters would sing. But th that was the full version of the song. Um, in the movie, uh, Neil Finn did a version of the of the the final song, which he extended and wrote and developed, um, which I absolutely love. But um, n no, I I'm hoping there'll there'll be uh, more more singing in movies two and three. How much of an input did you and the other dwarves have into the final looks of your characters? Um, the whole process, working with Peter and his team, was collaborative. At every stage, my opinion was valued down to the, the shape of the, the, the body, the shape of the costumes, the length of the costume, the, the length of the hair. I remember asking for more grey at the sides because I felt that it, it would really give him uh, more age, and I wanted that, that pelt, the, the fur pelt, because I'd originally conceived Thorin um, as, uh, as being like a bison, and I wanted that upper body uh, bulk. Uh, and whenever I didn't have that fur on, I really felt that I was sort of missing a part of him. So as much as it was hot and heavy, and they'd always say, you know, you can do this scene without the pelt if you want, and I'd be like, no, no, I need it, I, I, I like it, it makes me feel like the character. Can you uh, talk more specifically about how the way you imagined Thorin as a child compares with the role you created under Peter's vision? Yeah, it's very interesting because I was trying to listen to both of those voices because I do remember very clearly reading the book uh, as a 12-year-old and then um, as a slightly older than 12-year-old man. Um, list, you know, as a kid, I, I was focused very much on Bilbo and then as an adult, I um, yeah, was focusing on Thorin. But I, I had seen him probably as a bit older. Um, but it was important that he was a potential king that he was somebody that could return to his throne and lead his people and show his prowess on the battlefield. So I, um, I, I think we, we found a, a place which was older than I am, um, but he still had the youth to be able to swing that sword around and, and you know, really fight for his, for his people, which was important. Hey Richard, um, I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about Peter Jackson's kind of technique with directing actors. So none of the technical direction, just how he, gets the performance out of the actors, you know, what he says, does he give you adjustments, etc. It was always very difficult to, to get Peter to sit down before you went onto set to talk about the character or the process or the story. He, he actually likes to have that conversation while the camera's rolling, so the whole thing feels like an experiment. He loves it when you develop an idea and he'll go with you. It takes a while for you to find that path together. But one of the things he does, which I absolutely love, is that he'll use another actor to get the performance out of somebody. So he doesn't necessarily come to you and say, I want this response. He'll take an actor away that you're going to work with. Um, I had a moment um, in movie three, which I can't talk about, um, <laughs> with Martin, um, where I was in the middle of a scene, and, and he took Martin away. I didn't know this, that he'd done this. And Martin came back and, and played something to me which got quite an extraordinary response from me that I had not predicted. Um, and that was the take. And that's exactly what he does. And, and he did it to me as well. I have a scene with, um, with Keeley. Um, and he took me aside and he said, I want you to say this. I want you to do this. And you know, we got the response from, from Aidan. And I, it's such a great way to work because you don't know that he's having an effect on you. From an actor's perspective, can you tell me what you learned that was different doing something as massive as The Hobbit as opposed to doing TV series like Spooks and Robin Hood, and which do you prefer? Um, the main thing really is time. Um, and when you've got a budget like um, we had for The Hobbit, it, it buys you so much time. Um, so I really, because in television you do two or three takes and you, you move on, and there's, there's this urgency to the shoot. 
I mean, don't get me wrong, there was an urgency to the shoot, but there was time to experiment, and, and really that's what I'm talking about in regards to that last question. Um, but also working on a green screen, uh, which I'd never done before, uh, I was I was nervous of it, but but in fact, what it does is it fires up your imagination. And you know, I I come from a theatre background, so uh, it was tapping into a lot of old th things that I'd forgotten about that that you have to imagine. So I I really enjoyed that aspect of it. What elements of Thorin's character can you relate to the most? And do you have any personal life experiences that helped you shape your portrayal of Thorin? I suppose the thing I, I really love about Thorin really is that he he does have a fear uh, of what he's going to do. It's he is stepping into the unknown and he's he's um, on a path towards something which um, is both thrilling. Um, he, he will get to be the, a king and he will accumulate a huge amount of wealth. But at the same time, in that mountain is the most terrifying thing that he's ever experienced in his life. And he, ha he has experienced it. You know, the dragon, really, I, I assimilated that to a holocaust of some kind. Whether, I mean, I was using the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima in terms of the, ex you know, the extraordinary devastation that it caused. So he's experienced that. So, I mean, I think that's the thing that, that I um, was most fascinated with, is that he's walking towards something that he wants, but at the same time, it's repelling him. And Tolkien did write about that story in the appendices, which uh, we, we were allowed to use as a source reference. So, I mean, I love to write a biography for the character, so I used all of that, um, and then added some things myself um, that I, that I th felt would help me, because I knew we were going to do a prologue, so um, I, I tried to imagine what happened on that day when the dragon came, um, so that when uh, that character opens the door to the mountain and smells the air, it, it has such a sense memory for him of, of, uh, of what happened to him as a child. And, you know, all of these things, as much as they burden him, they drive him forward. So it was one of the best reasons to play the role. Of the scenes that you, or the stunts you were legally allowed to do, what would have been your favourite stunt? The, the, yeah, my favourite stunt was one that I... Um, that I didn't know I was going to be able to do. I'd watched uh, my stunt double do it, Mana Davis, who was, who was absolutely brilliant. Um, and it was the scene where, it was actually an additional scene, we did it in pickups. When we're on the mountain, when the stone giants are fighting, and Bilbo falls off the side, and then Thorin climbs down and then falls. Um, and we were doing it on a wire, and Mana came to me and said, I think you can do this. And I was like, okay, if you think I can do it, then I'll do it. Um, so yeah, just getting on a wire and doing something that your stunt double has already shot um, is thrilling. But you know, I love doing as many of the stunts as possible, not because it gives you a sense of uh, heroicism, but it makes you really feel like you're playing the character. If you get to do everything that the character does, it's just very satisfying. Who would win in a cage fight, Thorin or Dwalin? And also, would you ever consider coming to Melbourne for a convention? <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, I'll come to Melbourne for a convention. Uh, as to the cage fight, you mean Dwalin and Thorin in a cage together? In a cage fight against each other, who would win? <laughs> I know that you're a method actor and you immerse yourself in a character and research beforehand. Was that easier or harder with makeup and green screens where a lot of it wasn't there already? Um, it was kind of essential, actually. Um, a lot of the um, discomfort with the costume and the prosthetic was alleviated by just staying focused on the character. But also the way Pete works is sometimes he'll just call on you with half a minute to prepare and you have to dive straight into something. So it was really hard to take my mind off things and, and you know, engage too much. Although Dwalin and I did have a, a lot of games of table tennis uh, on G stage. But apart from that, but I was in character. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hi, Richard. Um, you've played a lot of sort of dark, brooding, grumpy characters. I wondered what your experience is, um, if you can comment on sort of casting to type and whether you're looking forward to choosing some different sorts of roles in the future? Um, it's a very good question. I, I always get very nervous when I, when I read something that feels close to myself because I predict that I won't get it because I'm, I'm sort of better at being somebody that's very far away from myself, I think. Um, but of course, I, 
fantasize about playing, you know, the romantic lead and, and the heroic character. I just don't think my face suits that. I think that there's something <laughs> dark and malevolent about me. Um, so yeah, there you go. <laughs> Was that agreement? I think you're right. You do look inherently evil. So. I do. <laughs> We all know that Peter Jackson was an absolute groundbreaker in technology when it came to Lord of the Rings. Were you expecting the level of groundbreaking technology that he included, like the red cameras and the HFR and uh, the extra 3D technology that he was actually shooting live with? You know, when you're shooting it, you're really not aware of um, any kind of Techno technological differences between the cameras, apart from the fact that with digital you can do a, what's called a rolling reset, which, uh, which is, I think, something Peter just uses himself, whereby you don't cut camera, you just keep going and, and you go again immediately. And for an actor, that's an absolute gift because you don't have time to think about it or overthink it or self-note or overanalyze. Um, so you, it's very freeing. Um, the only thing that was a struggle and a challenge was um, to get the scale issue right. Um, he developed a, a technique called slave motion control where some actors are in a green room, some are on a scale set, and the two cameras are coordinated. So often, um, I think I had one scene in the second movie, which we're not allowed to talk about, um, <laughs> whereby there were 300 people on set and I was alone in a green room uh, with 25 eye lines little crosses on the wall um, but again you you try to fire up your imagination you go back onto the main set you rehearse again and you take that feeling away with you and you just shoot immediately so yeah lots of challenges what was it like filming scene 88 i think it was the walk chase we heard from dean stephen and graham that it was really full on what was it like for you they're just weak <laughs> um Scene 88 was a chase sequence, um, and it felt like we ran throughout the whole of the North and the South Islands. Um, but you know, it was so great to be out in those incredible locations, I've, places that I've never seen in my life and probably never will again. Um, but I, I do remember every day strapping up my ankles with, with tape because the ground was so uneven that, that you could really twist your ankle. And obviously, you can't have limping Thorin at the front of scene 88, can you? So, no, it was a challenge. Now, Richard, Andy Serkis's work has been groundbreaking, and he got to work with um, Martin Freeman. But there's another character who I can imagine you wouldn't think would be working in a mocap situation. And it's the character played by Benedict Cumberbatch. And a thought hit me that it's quite possible that Peter Jackson would get Smaug and you in the room together. And I'm just wondering whether that's happened or whether you've actually talked about it. That's a real spoiler. <laughs> um, I went into the motion capture studio because I wanted to see how Benedict worked. Um, I'm a huge fan of his. I love the fact that they've cast him because it means that the dragon has an incredible intellect and an incredible voice. I also think that they maybe are gonna use certain aspects of his bone structure in the face of the dragon, but nobody knows, nobody knows yet. <laughs> Um, but I don't know, I don't know if Thorin and Smaug ever come face to face. That's something I'll find out when we go back to do reshoots. I hope so. And finally, I'd like to, something that's been touched on with a few questions, but I think it's summed up in the fact that you worked at the appendices and you went back to the original material and you were influenced by Tolkien and many fans here were inspired by Tolkien and now seeing it come to life is one thing. But I'm wondering, what would you ask him about your character and this story, if you could? The one thing that I would want to know, and it's something, again, I, I tried to fill in in my little biography, was um, who was the love of his life? Because I felt that um, he's sacrificed his life or he's given up something um, for his people, for his quest. And I, I did imagine that there might have been... Um, you know, a princess that he, he would have been betrothed to um, as king under the mountain. Um, so that's probably what I would ask Tolkien. I know. <laughs> Are you welling up? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that sums it up.
Richard Armitage in a nutshell, a class act. Please put your hands together for an actor and a man who's brought Tolkien to life. One of the biggest moments was when we all put our gear on and we all stood together, sort of looking around at each other into the characters' faces. To stand in a circle and look at the guys that were going on the quest, I got a real tingle up my spine.